The next section of our lesson in chapter 17 talks about titrations. We are probably very familiar with titrations from experiences in the lab. Realizing a titration is simply using an instrument known as a burette to deliver a known quantity of acid and base to reach neutralization. A couple of handy things our notepad begins by explaining is the term millimole. M mole for a millimole is one thousandth of a mole. Oftentimes, chemists who work in small amounts prefer millimoles over milliliters instead of the usual mole per liter, since the calculations then are made easier. We rarely add liters of solution through a titration. More often, we add milliliters. If you hear the term millimole, at least you have been exposed to it. I tend to stick with the unit we're most familiar with, big M, moles per liter, and simply hit molarity times liter to pull out the number of moles, making the stoichiometry more familiar. But I did at least want to share the term millimole. When we look at adding a solution of known concentration until the substance being tested is consumed, and what that really is showing us is an acid-base neutralization. If I'm adding a base to an acid, the acid gets consumed until it has been neutralized. What this is simply known as reaching the equivalence point. The equivalence point is indeed when the acid ion is equal to the base ion in solution. A graph of pH versus milliliters is simply known as a titration curve. And a great deal of information can be gained by examining titration curves of the various types of acids with bases. So in a titration curve, we can use them, for instance, to determine the equivalence point by simply looking at where the acid equal base ion, we can find the equivalence point of our solution. And they can also be used to determine the Ka of a weak acid or a Kb for a weak base if they are indeed involved in the titration. So having said that, we will examine three varieties, three kinds of titrations in our notes. We will examine strong acid versus strong base. Strong versus strong. We remember the seven strong acids, and those that are water-soluble hydroxides create strong bases. Strong versus strong is a unique stoichiometric ratio. So a second category would be using a weak acid to a strong base. Or I would also classify if we did a strong acid weak base. But what I'm generally saying here is strong versus weak, either one of those being applied. And the last type of curve that's unique is coming from a polyprotic acid where we see the ionization of each proton let go one at a time. Strong versus strong, weak versus strong, and a polyprotic acid all have different looks to their titration curves. We will examine in the first part strong acid with strong base. And when I think of strong versus strong, it's really nothing more than a stoichiometry problem in which we determine what the limiting reagent and what the excess reagent ends up to be to determine the pH. The stoichiometry determines the titration curve. Remember, and just to give an example, if HCl is being titrated with NaOH, this would be an example of a strong acid with a strong base. We recognize the single displacement pattern where we produce a salt, NaCl, and water. The important point to note is if the salt has parents that are both strong, there is no hydrolysis from the salt. The sodium chloride will not affect the pH. The only ingredients that affect the pH are the acid and the base on the left side of the arrow. So when I think strong versus strong, it's simply looking at do we have excess acid, and is it controlling the pH? Or do we have excess base, and is it controlling the pH? Or are we indeed at the stoichiometric equivalence point where we do not have an excess or limiting reagent and giving us a pH of 7, exactly neutral? So 
Keep in mind, there is no equilibrium if both parents are strong. What we're saying is the salt has no effect on the pH as it's forming. And since the acid and base are both strong, they both dissociate completely, giving us a net ionic equation to keep track when an acid ion combines with a base ion and produces water. What controls the pH is the excess reagent as we add additional amounts of either the acid or base through the course of the titration. Let's turn our page and examine further. If we consider a titration where we have a known amount, so let's say 50 milliliters, of a strong acid, HNO3, and we begin to look at 0.1 molar NaOH being added to it, we can simply analyze the graph into different regions. And let's just examine the pH as we draw the graph down below. So what I'll end up doing is drawing a little graph where we'll place pH units on the y-axis, and the volume of base that is being added in our titration on the x-axis, and we'll measure that volume in milliliters. Now, if we're looking at adding base to a strong acid, when I begin placing my pH probe into the solution that's sitting in the Erlenmeyer flask, that would be the acid. So kind of thinking about this drawing, and you know that's my forte, this will be a burette that delivers the base. And that base is exactly 0.1 molar NaOH. So in the burette sits the base, and we have that ready to deliver. Down in the Erlenmeyer flask, we would have, oh my, the nitric acid, HNO3. And we happen to know it's 0.2 molar and that it's 50 mils. So initially, we add the phenolphthalein in, and it's clear because we are in the acid solution. So at the beginning point, the initial point on our pH versus volume would be the concentration of the nitric acid. There's been no base added yet. So pH could be found directly by taking the negative log of 0.2 molar the initial concentration of the acid. And that would just come to us from our pH meter as we placed it in the solution. So imagine having a pH meter giving us accurate measurements, the initial pH found from the concentration of the acid. But as we open up the burette and allow the strong base to enter, we start to notice the pH change. And again, if a base is being added to an acid, it would make sense to see the pH slowly begin to climb. And it will do so as the acid is being consumed. What I mean by that, as the acid is being consumed, we're adding base, taking out the hydrogen ion as we begin to neutralize. So we see the pH begin to climb, and then we notice near the equivalence point, near the stoichiometric ratio of the perfect one-to-one -one amount, we start to see a steep incline. A steep incline means that we're near or perhaps at the neutralization point. And then, of course, we continue to add base and it begins to level off and we've overshot the end point. So the flavor of a strong versus strong, we start to see a slow and steady rise shoot straight up high and then levels off again. What we would notice is right in the middle of this steep incline is the neutralization point and our pH would be exactly 7.0 when a strong acid is neutralized with a strong base. So I'm examining this curve, and I notice four different regions that we could consider as we think about what the pH meter would be telling us. First, we mentioned the initial pH could be determined. And when I think about labeling the initial pH, I'm talking about right here, 0.1, the initial pH reading. And we mentioned since there is no base, the pH comes directly from the concentration of the strong acid. We said up above, since we were looking at 0.2 molar in the first example, negative log of 0.2 gives me that initial concentration's pH. Or suppose we were titrating with the strong acid of hydrochloric. 
0.1 molar of HCl would have a pH of 1. So the initial concentration of the acid gives us the initial pH simply because we've not added base yet. Let's consider in the second region where we're between the initial point and the equivalence point. So thinking about that on the graph, point 1, no base has been added, but point 2 would be the region this area, we have yet to reach the equivalence point, but we've begun to add acid. So when we begin to add acid, the pH rises slowly at first, that would be this region, then rapidly when it nears the equivalence point. Notice how it gains a steep curve. In this case, the pH is determined by how much acid has yet to be neutralized. So in this area, keep in mind, we have excess acid, and that amount would be used to determine pH, negative log of the <coughs> excuse me, excess amounts. Now, at the equivalence point is the third point of interest. At the equivalence point, right here where we placed an X, we have a, an exact equal number of moles of base as we do acid leaving only in solution salt water. And because we know that sodium chloride in our example, both parents are strong, we mentioned it does not hydrolyze, so the pH comes out to be exactly 7. There is no calculation needed, pH equals 7 at the equivalence point of strong versus strong. If we overshoot the endpoint, the pH continues to rise. And that would be the fourth point of interest. Past the equivalence point, we continue to add base. The base becomes the excess reagent. So in region 4, after the end point, or after the equivalence point, the pH now is determined by the concentration of the excess amounts of NaOH. So in the first area below the pH of 7, excess acid determines pH. But above the equivalence point, we have excess base that has been added, and that hydroxide ion is going to drive our pH readings to be greater than 7.